Robert Kaplan, thank you for talking to us. Your latest book, In Europe's Shadow, includes a chapter titled The Pontic Breach, which deals with the region between the Carpathians and the Black Sea. You describe this Pontic Breach as a southern counterpart to the historical invasion route between Russia and Central Europe over the Polish plains. This area overlaps with the Republic of Moldova, parts of which you call the borderland of a borderland. Could you explain what you mean by that? Uh, yes. First of all, it's a, pl it's a great pleasure to be here with you. Uh, when you're in Moldova and you meet ethnic Ukrainians, ethnic Russians, the majority ethnic Romanians, and ethnic Christianized Gagauz Turks, you find that there's very little sense of a national identity. National identity in Moldova is weak. This is an area of the world formerly called Bessarabia, which switched between control by czarist Russia and Romania, the Soviet Union in Romania. It was never really independent until 1991 and the collapse of the Soviet Union. So there's very little sense of a defined state identity and the various ethnic groups within this borderland um, you know, have loyalties of some sort or another to other places, whether it's the ethnic Romanians to Romania, uh, the ethnic Ukrainians and, and, and Russians who have a, a sense of identity with Russia and Ukraine, the Turks with the, with the larger Turkic community. So it's Moldova is a work in progress. It's very weak. And its weakness, its weak spiritual identity, so to speak, is maybe at root to its weak institutions, which in turn leads to a high level of corruption and makes it easily undermined by an outside power such as, uh, such as Russia. Well, you, you mentioned in your book that as the former Eastern Bloc countries joined NATO and the European Union, Moldova had been regarded as a buffer state between Russia and the West. But Putin's move against Ukraine, which was the other much bigger buffer state, has turned both Moldova and its Western neighbor Romania into frontline states in a new Cold War. What are the stakes for Moldova? Yes, exact, exactly that. Putin's move into Ukraine puts Moldova in play to a degree it hasn't been since, the, since immediately after the collapse of the Soviet Union, when Transnistria, which is the eastern sliver of Moldova, on the other side of the Dniester River, was sort of partitioned away and made into a murky smuggler's paradise. Um, by Putin. So the stakes are essentially for Moldova and Romania that if Russia can solidify its influence in Ukraine, and that is still a big if, Romania and Moldova are more threatened than they were before. It gets more complicated, actually. We're Romania to annex Moldova or to unify with ethnic Romanian-speaking Moldova, that could lead Russia to formally annex Transnistria, and that would create far greater regional tensions than we see now. So, in your opinion, what would be the best path for Moldova to avoid turmoil or having, as you put it, a great future in the headlines? Would it be membership in NATO and the European Union, maybe through reunification with Romania, or a Russia-sympathetic neutrality modeled after Finland's stance during the Cold War? Um, I do not see how Moldova and Romania can unify. That would be almost the causes belli for Putin's Russia. So what Moldova needs to do, first of all, the most important thing, and this is true of Romania as well, is to strengthen its institutions, make them sturdier, more transparent, less corrupt, because no matter how many enemies a state may have on the outside, if it's strong institutionally inside, that constitutes the best form of defense. Moldova should seek associate, a stronger association membership with the European Union, Union, some sort of associated membership with NATO, but it cannot join formally these large institutions of the West without leading to a Russian backlash. R Moldova, for reasons of geography and history, sad to say, you know, is, a, is somewhat of a neutral buffer state that cannot, that should not and cannot join either alliance for the time being. What, what I see as 
probably being, you know, the lure for Moldova would be NATO's Article 5, which does protect member states against military aggression. But as you say in your book, it doesn't defend them against subversion, that is, from being taken over from within by a relentless weakening of their institutions, as you already mentioned. As a state, Moldova has been continuously weakened by Russia over the past 25 years. Now, when it should be as strong as possible in the face of the Ukrainian crisis, it's actually being on the verge of collapse. Aren't NATO and the European Union somehow running out of time in helping Moldova, since it looks like a race against the clock with Russia? Uh, yes, you put it very well. First of all, Moldova is not a member of the EU or of NATO, so Article 5 doesn't apply in any case. Nevertheless, as you said, Moldova is as close to the point of political chaos as is possibly imaginable. Um, with a weak, almost non-existent government, street demonstrations, incredibly high levels of corruption, which have led to a complete loss of confidence among the population. It wouldn't take much for Putin to undermine it. He probably already is doing so, uh, because as, as I write, um, with, uh, you know, Russia has various age-old forms of imperialist tactics, subversion, intelligence operations, buying media through third parties, uh, and, and on and on that are ambiguous enough to be deniable so that it's hard to West, the, for the West to unify and then to react. So that um, Moldova is... Moldova is kind of being unwoven. It's kind of coming apart without Russia having to do all that much. Well, both the European Union and NATO are faced with a pileup of crises, economic and monetary crunches and the conflict in eastern Ukraine, refugee exodus from the Middle East, Russia's recent direct involvement in Syria and so on. You, you have urged in a recent article in the Wall Street Journal a more robust American support of every country from the Baltic to the Black Seas, which you call the Greater Intermarium. How would you picture a stepped-up U.S. involvement in the region? Well, the first thing is, remember, in early 2012, President Obama withdrew two combat brigades from Europe and replaced them with rotating troops. Now, a brigade is not just a name. It's, you know, it's many thousands of troops. Um, so that withdrawing two combat brigades from Europe after the Soviet in invasion of Greater Georgia in 2008 was sort of Obama's mission accomplished moment. Um, you, know, it, it, you know, it was read in Russia, obviously, as some sort of a green or an orange light for more involvement in Ukraine and eventually in Syria. Now, lately, the Obama administration has been putting more rotating troops back in Europe and has been putting and has been starting to pre-position significant quantities of equipment in the greater intermarium. So they're sort of reversing the trend. But one thing, uh, you know, a new president can do, such as Hillary Clinton, who would want to distance herself from Obama in the early months of her presidency to show that although she's a Democrat, she's more robust and harder line, is to send back a brigade or two of permanent troops back to Central Europe. Well, diplomacy has always to be backed by military force, but how about diplomacy in itself? Shouldn't there be a, a, a stronger push in, in, in this line from the United States in the whole area? Yes, exactly. Uh, diplomacy, it goes without saying, it, um, has to be backed up by the threat of military force. But given that military force is being made more and more robust um, a, as we speak, um, remember with diplomacy, the most important resource a, a, a great power like the United States has is the time and the day of its principles, the Secretary of State, the President, the Secretary of Defense. And they need to be seen to be do to be paying more attention to Europe, because it's my contention that Europe is as important to the United States now as it was during the Cold War. Well, while you make clear in your book that you do not recommend any particular Western policy toward Moldova or other countries facing Russia, for that matter, you do issue a stark warning. There will be 
incalculable human costs to Western inaction. Could you explain what you mean? Yes. If Moldova were to become a satellite, a, an unofficial satellite of Russia, were it to um, continue to unravel, um, that has human consequences for the millions of people in Moldova in terms of a worse quality of life, uh, more separation from the outside world. Remember, if you want to see the human consequences between being a part of the European Union and not being a part of the European Union and being and being just part of the former Soviet Union, go back and forth between Moldova and Romania. The Romanian countryside looks increasingly wealthy, increasingly well-developed with new roads, new agricultural methods, um, all kinds of things that lead to a higher quality of life. You see almost none of that in Moldova. The differences between Moldova and Romania are stark. And they're stark because one country has been in the European Union for almost a decade now, and one is kind of still trapped in kind of post-Soviet underdevelopment. Robert Kaplan, thank you very much for talking to us. It's been my pleasure.